Mm. All right. So let's start. Uh, some technical issues. Um, uh, two things. So there was a question: What will be for the assignments? The assignments are not announced yet, but I will uh, try to do it either er er this week or early next week. And the first assignment will be to do with the UI, like what you did yesterday with the uh, Android Studio. So what we will do is we will um, create a, a simple template, and then you will have to um, fill in some of the gaps to have uh, approximately three or four activities. Um, activities, um, and they will have... Um, five to six fragments. Uh, and each fragment will have some UI elements. And then there will be interactions between those. So the complexity is kind of around this. Uh, and it will be quite straightforward. I, I would think it shouldn't take um, much time to, to finish it. So I will do it first. And then um, I will create like a test framework. So then you can try to fill in the gaps and run the, the JUnit testing framework to see if you actually comply with the requirements. So we will try to automate it, right? So um, auto-testing will be built in. Uh, so if you fill in everything and everything works as expected, then the test will tell you OK, and then you get max. If the test says, no, it's not OK, something fails, then you will get zero, right? So you will have either kind of a max if everything is fine, or zero if nothing is done. And then this assignment will not be marked. But it will be relatively straightforward. Make sense? Um, and then you, 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 we don't need to kind of run peer review on this because then it, like you will get the feedback automatically from a tool. Um, all right, so what we will do today is um, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, Android Studio and about kind of intents and activities. Uh, but before we start, um, there are um, basically um, three ways you can use Android Studio to build your application. So you can use Flutter. Um, who knows what Flutter is? What what it is? It's a framework developed by Google. It uses the Dart language to build UI components. For exactly. Cross platform. So Flutter is a cross platform framework for building mobile applications using the Dart programming language. So it's a different programming language to the other two, uh, and it uses kind of a component based, event based subsystem to use the UI. So if your application is kind of um, uh, heavily relying on the UI of the um, platform, uh, and it's relatively simple, you're not doing kind of a more kind of heavy logic or heavy domain specific things, then Flutter might be a good option, right? We don't use it. Um, so the other two options are Java or Kotlin, right? So I... If you kind of see here, you can create a Flutter project or you can create a project in Java or Kotlin, okay? Um, there is, um, so normally what you do, you start kind of a new project here and you choose Kotlin. Uh, there is, for those of you who are familiar with some of the concepts that were discussed yesterday and some of the concepts that we will discuss today, you can start the next step. And the next step is doing something with uh, storage, uh, so UI we kind of covering now, and basics for activity and so on. We're not really covering UI, but you can dive a little bit more into UI yourself. Um, so storage, um, permissions, um, what else do we need to cover? Um, from the basics, there is um, yeah, storage with room. Permissions, UI, um, I don't know. Like, I don't know what else basics is. Uh, but if you go to import Android uh, code samples, you can browse all the code which is already developed for Android. And it's like a skeleton template application, which you can check how it works and how it is organized. So if you go here, um, oh, come on. It was working before. Yeah, I will check. 
So we, we start and I will check in the break why it... I, I just tested it like <laughs> half an hour ago to kind of browse the new, um, new projects that they have. Uh, so I will check it out. So what we will do, we will kind of start a new project. And then you have some options. So you have options of what code is generated for you initially, right? And we usually start with an empty activity, but if you, for example, planning to build an app that has a kind of a sidebar, or planning an app that has a kind of an action button, yeah, it's kind of good to start with the template that already gives you that, right? Um, so you can check what those kind of, um, what those views are, and then pick one that is most suitable for the app that you want to do. Um, those of you who want to do native development, uh, as I said before, you can use C++, uh, but it's a little bit uh, involved. So it involves kind of um, fiddling with NDK and with the command line tools. Yeah, I don't kind of recommend that for starting. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, we start with this. And you started with this yesterday. You pick, um, yeah, so let's say basic application. You pick your package. So package should be something that you kind of control and that is unique to you. So we usually have com or org dot imt3673, which means we it's kind of our course examples. You should choose something like a domain name or something that you own that you, you kind of it's unique to you that will not conflict with everybody else, right? So if you, for example, submitting your projects later on in this course and everybody has com dot example, right? That's not good because then we can't install more than one app on the phone because this is like a prefix, which means what that kind of app is, and then it messes up everything, right? So this should be unique to you, right? It can be your name, it can be your domain name that you own, it can be something that is unique to you. So don't say com.example because that's not unique to you, like everybody says that, right? Um, and then you pick Kotlin. Um, so you've done that yesterday, you generate the, um, the basic skeleton. I will change the fonts. Oh, you, you, appearance. Visible or bigger? It's, it's okay? Back to the yeah, the, the guys at the back. Maybe a little bit bigger. Yeah, a little bit bigger. That or more? More? All right. Good. The the side. This. Yeah. Let's do one more. I don't see a lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> All right, so we should see that, and then I need one more for code. Font. Yeah, let's try that. Yes. They didn't thought it through, and the editor font didn't change for some reason. Let's do it again. Yeah, so that sucks. So it's in three places. So there is a default style, default font, and font for the menus. <laughs> yeah, very customizable. All right, so my network is not working. What's not working? Yeah, network is not working. So let's try again. Yeah. So now things work. Now, okay, so probably that was the reason. Uh, network was not working and therefore, so I will close this project. I just go through the previous train of thought. Um, 
we come back here in a moment. So if you go import Android code samples, it will uh, show you like a, a big menu. And then you can, um, so this is for Android things for like um, Raspberry Pi or some kind of embedded devices. So that you can skip that unless you're really interested. And then from animation onwards, everything is to do with the apps. So for example, if you want to explore basic transitions of the UI elements, you can kind of um, instantiate the project, which will give you all the code and an example app, which plays with the animations. And then you can see how they are used, how they are instantiated and how they work. And usually those code samples are excellent. They are developed by Google engineers and they are kind of really like um, a good guidance of how things should be done on Android, right? Because if you Google uh, things on Stack Overflow and so on, sometimes you get high quality answers and code samples, but sometimes they are kind of crap. Uh, those code samples are almost always very high quality. So you will learn a lot by like browsing from those code samples and they also have a very good starting point if you want to develop an app, right? So there is a, a really long list of different things. So like about transitions or motion or interpolators, like how to interpolate mo movement of the UI elements and so on, um, how to reveal, um, um, how the uh, reveal effect kind of works and so on. And it, it kind of goes on and on. So there is a lot of about uh, storage and about uh, reactive uh, patterns and um, basic for accessing camera and working with the camera feeds, uh, doing some Bluetooth or some uh, connectivity experiments with Wi-Fi direct or with Beam, um, about data binding, um, this, yeah, a very quick start for Firebase access. We will cover Firebase later on. So you can basically kind of browse through this and see what is that really resonates with what you want to do. And then you can generate a sample app and kind of build on top of that. Usually what I do is I generate a sample app and then browse it, but I don't change it. I create a, my own project and then copy and paste code from the basic, like the generated app into my project because I want my namespace to be the one I want and I want certain things to be the way I want. And sometimes you want features being from two or three different sample apps, then you can basically copy uh, and paste your activities and the code examples into your code, change the package names, and then it will work nicely, right? Um, so the ones I would like, uh, I would recommend you to check is um, the one about the sensors um, and some of the user interface things. Um, so um, notification is, we will cover notifications later on as well. Um, uh, you can check text styling, you can check, yeah, I mean, you can check whatever kind of interests you for the uh, second assignment and for the project. For the second assignment and for the project, you pick what you want to do. So you can kind of uh, bootstrap from one of those apps. Uh, you will notice that uh, sometimes the apps are twice, written twice. So for example, you have permission uh, example, and there is a runtime permission example in nothing, which means Java or runtime permission example with Kotlin, right? Um, that's why I was uh, suggesting that you will kind of need to know a little bit of Java sometimes. Uh, they are exactly the same. They just use, um, they use the same uh, Android API methods to set and react to permissions. It's just that one of them is using Java and one of them is using Kotlin. But even if you're using Kotlin, you can generate the Java one and see which methods on Android you need to call, and then you call them from Kotlin, right? So you don't need to sort of uh, do Java. You can just understand the kind of the logic of it. Um, and reading Java, it's yeah, it should be quite uh, self-explanatory. So if you have trouble and there is a Kotlin version, always use the Kotlin version. But sometimes there is none. So for example, if you want to um, so this one has three examples. It has for Java, it has for Kotlin, and it has for Android Wear, like on the watch. Um, sometimes you don't have, um, um, yeah. So for example, here we have recognizing the current user activity and it's only for Java. And then basic location and basic location is for Java and Kotlin. So you have two different ones. 
So if you can, use the Kotlin one. If you can't, well, generate it, check the logic, and then use it in your Kotlin app, right? Uh, so this is a very good resource. Um, so let's go back to the one which we have. Um, and yesterday, we kind of did that. Um, uh, you did that with Carol and Elizabeth. And she said that, like, all the initialization step kind of is in the onCreate method, right? Uh, which is true. Um, the Android, um, let me just fire up. Um, yeah, let's do Chrome. So, so there is a certain life cycle related to the activity, and it kind of, yeah, this should be fine. And it, it's big enough, you can read the method, so no, at the back, I will kind of read it. Um, so when the activity is launched, onCreate is called. And then onCreate is called only once, and it will never be called again un unless the activity is completely destroyed from the operating system, right? So all the one-time initialization that you need to do, you do in the onCreate method. Um, and then onStart is called, onResume is called, and then your activity is in a kind of a running state. Um, so if your activity is in, in the foreground and you're interacting with it, you kind of hear. And then let's say a phone call came. So when the phone call happens, the phone app will show up on the top and your app will be behind, right? So then your activity will call on pause. So when your activity is not on the foreground, on pause is called, and then your activity is not in the running state, it's kind of on in the post state, right? And then the phone call finished, you kind of finish call the, the talk, and your activity is back up. So then on resume is kind of back up, right? So those two methods are matching. So when something kind of hides your activity, on resume is called, and then when your activity is back on the foreground, on pause is called. Uh, on pause is called when it's hidden, and on resume is called when it shows up again, right? So every time, you want something that uh, to initiate to, in, to initialize that the user needs for the running app. You do an on resume, and then when the app is not running, like the app is paused, you kind of clean it up and on pause. So one time initialization happens in on create, but we often use those two to, for example, uh, keep a current state of the app somewhere, so then the user doesn't start from scratch. Imagine that we have a form. Um, like we have a kind of a form um, and the user is filling it up, right? So the user kind of fills up the form and then the phone call happens and your activity kind of gets behind. Um, and then what would happen is uh, the state of the app might be kind of uh, not maintained persistently, right? Uh, so what you want is you want to store something on the disk. When your app comes back, you kind of read it from a disk and get the user where it was, where the user was. Um, so on create is matching with on stop, right? So on stop is called when you swipe your app from the memory, like if you want to kill it, right? Um, or if your app is behind, it's not in the foreground, it hasn't been in the foreground for a while, and the operating system thinks, well, you know, somebody started up this app, but was not using it for a while, we can kind of ditch it. So then on stop and on destroy will be called. There is no recovery from like when on destroy is called, the whole thing needs to start from the very beginning. But sometimes when you swipe the app and the operating system has been called on destroy yet, your app will kind of go back to on restart, right? So you like you swipe your app off, it's still kind of lurking there, and then you, you press the launch button and you want to relaunch it. So it will not go on create again, it will kind of go back on restart and on start and then on resume. Right? So those calls happens always when, uh, whenever you're kind of somewhere here, this, so if, if, if the app is paused, it will be resumed. If the app was stopped and then initiated, it will be restart and start. 
and when the app is destroyed, then you have to start with on create, right? So the, the bottom line here is that on create happens once and only once in the whole duration of the app, right? So what would you do in typically in on create? Well, you typically will create all the UI that you need for the app because that's one time event, like one time job, right? Once you create all the UI for the activity, then if the activity is destroyed, you have to recreate it again from scratch. So all the initialization of the UI usually happens in uh, on create. Why it doesn't happen in on, on resume, for example? Why we don't uh, why we don't put it here in um, on resume? Yeah. Exactly. It would kind of generate kind of a poor user in, um, experience first of all because there will be a lag before your app kind of is uh, returned from a post state. Also, you'll be chewing the CPU and battery all the time. Every time your app is in the foreground or in the background, foreground, background, foreground, background, you want to limit what you're actually doing there. Um, so we, we usually do this on resume and on post only for the things that we really have to do multiple times, like persistent of the state. Um, okay, so uh, we have a very simple activity. If we um, generate a second one, so let me, and this activity is called main activity, right? Uh, this is a convention, some, like it's up to you how you name your, uh, your types in uh, Kotlin or in Java. Um, usually um, you, you call one of the activities kind of a main activity because that's the one which the launcher launches and it shows up as the first activity of your app. And it's good to know which one that is because if you have uh, if I have multiple activities, like for example, uh, login activity, um, data fetch, um, I don't know, uh, map, and usually we call them activity in the type so we know um, that it is an activity. Um, then if I have a list of those, let's say I have like six of those, uh, which one is the main one which is started? I would need to go to the manifest file to see which one is the main. If I call one of them main, uh, then it's kind of logical, kind of a template that yes, that's the probably the one which is the entry point, right? Um, it's a convention. It's it's up to you how to how you do that, right? Um, so let's generate. A, um, yeah, before we generate, also I you you covered that a little bit yesterday um, that we have. A structure here, right? Uh, so Android Studio is quite com like complex. It's a lot of different things, and you don't need to know everything, right? You will learn like step by step so some aspects of what it offers you, um, and you don't need to know like everything everything from the start. But it's useful to know um, um, that we have. Um, the source code is kind of organized here into the package and then my my class for the main activity is kind of sitting here as a source code and then I have a resource folder. So the resource folder has a number of um, subfolders and those subfolders are kind of meaningful. They they again by convention. So the way they are named means that I can use it with this magic R um class right and if i said r dot layout it means it's resource dot this folder right and then in this folder i have files and in those files i can have uh some content and in this case i expect there inside the layout folder to have a file called activity underscore main and it will be a resource file which is an XML file, which defines me the layout for the main activity, which is set here. So if I go resource layout, surprise, surprise, I have activity underscore main XML, which is that exact resource that I'm referencing here, right? This, oops, this R um, resource is generated for you. So Android Studio, like the build process will 
every time you update this, every time you put a new file or do something here, will kind of update the R uh, class, so then you can use this R dot notation to access it. Uh, what else useful do we have here? Um, we have uh, things like values, for example. So let's um, let's go to the uh, UI. Let's add a text field. Um, so this is the XML view of the layout. Um, and you, you've been playing with it yesterday. And we will just add a text. Um, now, there is already a text view here, which says, hello world, right? And the hello world is hard-coded. It's a hard-coded string that will show up when the UI is rendered. It kind of takes ages here for the preview. But um, there is basically a white screen with a text, like a li white um, black label on the white screen, which says hello world. Um, what I can do is I can go to values. And inside values, we have like um, a component. Uh, so all those values are basically key value pairs. The way I organize them in the files doesn't matter. So they will always be accessible uh, based on the, the file name and the key which is in that file. So if, if you go into colors, you see that there is like a color primary, which is this, and color primary dark, which is this. So it's a key and value, key and value, right? And this resource defines some colors. Uh, this resource defines some strings. So I have a key value, but the value is a string, right? So what I can do here, I can uh, define a new, um, I can define a new resource, which we will call greeting. And then I will say, um, hello world. Okay, so now I have a new key value pair, and the value is hello world. So now if I go back here, um, and I, instead of the hard-coded string, um, so in the code, we reference all those things saying r dot. In here, the notation is a little bit different. We say um, ampersand. No, that, that, that symbol. Um, and then we can say, um, we can say, for example, no, that's without the, um, yeah, it needs to refresh the, um, yeah, I don't know why it's, it's taking that long. The idea here is that I can reference the, um, the resource which I have in my REST folder, and then make it um, dynamic, dynamically read from this kind of a resource files. And the benefit of that is that Android has a localization mechanism where you can change English text into Norwegian text, for example, dynamically, without kind of doing it uh, manually by providing alternative um, value systems for the key value pairs. So every time I'm referencing this uh, this string, I can have a different folder called values minus NB, which will stand for book mode. And then in there, if I create a, a key with a different value, which will be hero world in uh, book mode, then every time I'm running the app in the Norwegian localization, it will pick the other one, right? We will talk a little bit about it later. The bottom line here is that you should not hard code your strings in the UI or in your app. What you should do is you should uh, use the string resource to put all your strings in the resource, and then it's much easier to localize it to a different languages or to make it more robust because you can do that not only for the languages, but you can do that for the resolution of the screen or for the orientation of the screen, right? So for example, if you have a particular text, um, so let's say you have um, some, you, you have an app, and in the landscape mode, uh, you have kind of like a label. So let's say there is a text field you need to enter, and then here you have some explanation what it is, right? So you said blah, 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 right? And let's say this is like uh, 30 characters long, right? 
uh, if someone turns the phone around and you have the same form and your UI takes um, um, certain amount of space, let, yeah, let's say it's different, like it, it's like this, and then the explanation is here. So here you have much more space, right? So let's say you have 60 characters description of what that is. If we do this, then suddenly you only have 30 or less, right? So, and you don't want to be two liner, right? So this description on the uh, landscape orientation can be longer and description here can be shorter and you can use the string uh, uh, resource to differentiate between the, the string which will be led for this label that based on the orientation, right? Um, so you can use um, locale for this, you can use the orientation of this of the of the screen, and funnily enough, you can even use um, the operator which the user is using on the phone to differentiate what string you show them, right? So you can use the telco operator. So people who, for example, run on Telia will see different text to people who are running on Telenor, right? Uh, you can differentiate that based on the operator it's, uh, uh, itself. So, um, yeah, that is really taking forever. So let's, let's drop that for, for, for a moment. Uh, I will just go back to the hello um, and go back to the code. Um, and now what I will do is um, we will talk a little bit about intents. So what are the intents? Um, if I create a new, um, so if I go to source, and I say new, uh, no, let's go to the project and say new, oh, come on. Uh, yeah, let me try something, something else. I am missing something. <laughs> yeah, I can see what it says. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, so what do you see if you say, um, if you go new on the project or if you go new on inside the package in your Android Studio, what can you choose? So on the package in your, like where the main activity lives, if you double like uh, right click and go new, what do you see down here as templates? Do you see that you can create a new activity? Exactly, and I don't. <laughs> so create a new activity and I will kind of try to figure out why I don't have that. Um, and you can, again, you will be prompted what type of activity you want. And you can say, I want a basic activity, make it kind of a useful name, maybe call it like a, a second activity or something. And then you will kind of have two activities. You will have the main activity and the second one, second activity, right? Uh, do that one more time to have a third activity, okay? So we will have uh, three activities. Um, So let's do this. Uh, you have the main activity first, 
So main activity. Then you will create one more. Let's call it second. Second activity and the third. Um, for the sake of uh, playing with it, create uh, two buttons. Um, create two buttons here and two buttons here. Uh, this will be quit. This will be uh, second activity. This we will call um, this we will call back button, right? I will call it cancel, cancel, and then this one we will call three, and then from three we we will go back. Um, so um, yeah, let's let's say one and two. So from two we want to go to two, from three we want to go to three. The cancel should kind of destroy this activity and by default kind of goes back here. But we will not program that, we will only program cancel. The back button uh, here, here and here, we will discuss what it should do. And then we will kind of uh, work with this one launching one activity again and two launching second activity again. Okay? And I will work out what's wrong with my ID. So let's have a 10 minutes break and then we come back with this with this scenario.